24, verses 36 through 53. And if you'd like to follow along, it's on page 91 in the New Testament portion of the Bibles and the Pews. Luke 24, verses 36 through 53. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. It begins as Jesus appears to his disciples. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving, still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses the prophets and the Psalms which must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that the repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in the name in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and you see I am sending Excuse me. I am sending upon you what my father promised. So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with the power from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he withdrew from them and was carried up to heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they were continually in the temple blessing God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, as we open up your word to us this morning, as we examine this scripture passage, Lord, we pray once again that your spirit would be here among us that you would open our eyes to what you have for us this morning. Lord, and I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts would be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as we continue on this Easter journey, moving towards Pentecost, that we'll be celebrating next week, we come to this passage from Luke. This is how Luke ends his gospel account of Jesus. With Jesus once again showing himself to his disciples, eating some fish, giving them this missionary charge, and then ascending into heaven. Well, that's sort of how Luke ends his gospel account. I say sort of because because that's how this book in the Bible ends. But Luke also wrote the book of Acts, which in our Bible comes after the book of John. But he wrote them as kind of a two-part series. So the book of Acts tells the story of the beginnings of the church and the beginnings of her mission into the world. And we'll start, we'll look at that next week when we look at when we celebrate Pentecost. So really, Luke, this ending of the book of Luke, is really more like the end of Act 1 and the setup for Act 2. So what we have here isn't so much an ending as it is a type of transition. A transition from the point where Jesus is there, he's walking around, he's, he enjoys this nice fish dinner with his disciples, and it's a transition to where he's, he's not there in the same way. He's not there in this, no longer there in this reach out and touch him sort of way. But as Luke will discuss in Acts and as we'll look at next week, Jesus is still there with the church, just in a slightly different way. 
And Luke will have a lot to say about that throughout the book of Acts and the church's mission into the world. But, but right now, this morning, this transition point, well, it's really about promises. If you want to know the truth, I think actually most of Scripture and the very basis for the gospel message and our gospel hope, they hinge on promises. In fact, Jesus hints at that here after he's enjoyed that nice bit of broiled fish with his disciples. He says, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. See, what Jesus is saying is that all of history, from the very beginning, it's been about a promise. The Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, and what Jesus would have simply referred to as the scriptures, it's sometimes referred to in Hebrew by, by the three letters T, N, and K. It's sometimes called the Tanakh. T stands for the Hebrew word for law, Torah. N for the Hebrew word for prophets, Nevi'im. And K for the Hebrew word for writings, Ketavim. And Psalms were often a shorthand way of talking about the writings, everything that didn't fit into the category of the law and the prophets. And so when someone talks about the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms or the writings, what they are talking about is everything. They're talking about all of it. So what Jesus is saying here, what Jesus is talking about is all of God's self-revelation to the world. All of God's work throughout history, beginning with the, be beginning, with the beginning. All of God's work towards redemption and forgiveness and repentance. What he's saying is that all of God's work, everything that God has been up to throughout history, has been about a promise that finds its fulfillment in him. In Jesus, God's promises are fulfilled. And that's why, that's why it is so important and it is so profound that Jesus eats that fish. I know, that's a weird thing to say. But let's think about it. Why is it important that Jesus eats the fish? Ghosts don't eat. Souls floating around don't need to eat stuff. What needs to eat? Bodies. Only physical bodies need to take in physical nourishment. Jesus is making it as clear as day that he is not simply a ghost or a spirit, or that the resurrection simply means that some sort of wispy spiritual life after death has happened. Now, Jesus wants to make it abundantly clear to his disciples and to us that something far more dramatic, something far more revolutionary, something profoundly more important has happened. He has been raised from the dead, body and all. There is a resurrected, bodily, physical person walking around, talking with the disciples, eating that fish. See, this is no common, everyday Greek notion of some sort of immortal soul that naturally lives on after death, which, by the way, would not have been a new concept even at that time to the disciples. That's why they were, they were thinking it was a ghost, and Jesus had to correct them. No, this is something else entirely. Jesus was dead, but now he, all of him, the word made flesh, is alive. So allow me to draw out a little bit why this matters as much as it does, and why this fact is actually the fulfillment of God's promises. To do that, we need to go back in time a little bit. What did God do in the beginning. He created. He created everything that is. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created stuff. God created things. God created bodies. God created people, physical people formed from the dust of the ground. And then what did he say about all the stuff that he had created? Do you remember? 
It is good. 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 It is very good. That's how many times he says it in the opening passages of the Bible. God's not talking about some sort of goodness that's somehow trapped inside of the physical shell that's just dying to be released. God is talking about the stuff itself that he has made. And yes, things do go downhill after that a little bit. We mess it up. We let sin enter in. Sin starts to get a grip on all this good stuff that God has made, and it becomes corrupted. We become corrupted. And I know I don't need to tell you that. We know it, don't we? We look around the world. We look in the mirror. All this good stuff that God created, it's, it's become bent and scuffed up and broken. Things are not the way they should be. You and I are not the way we should be. But let me suggest to you this morning that when God creates, and when God claims that what he has created is good, and even as very good, he is not just making an objective, detached analysis of the situation at that particular time. God is making an intimate statement of care and concern and commitment to his creation. When God steps back and says, it is good, it is very good, this is like an artist who has poured herself into her work, crafting everything just so, so that when it's finished, all she can do is step back and say, it's good. This is exactly what I wanted to create. And so when sin comes in and corrupts, scuffs up the good and the beautiful work of art, you don't just toss it out. No, it is your creation. You do whatever you can to clean it, to repair it, to bring it back. And maybe even in the process, making it somehow better than it was before. That is the promise of God when he says, it is good. That is the promise of God that is revealed throughout the unfolding story of God working in and through his people, through the law of Moses, the prophets, and all those other writings and psalms that Jesus refers to. That is the promise that is fulfilled in Jesus and in his bodily, physical, flesh resurrection. Because this is the fulfillment of of God's promise to all that he has created. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul refers to Christ's physical resurrection as, as the first fruits of all those who are in Christ. His resurrection is a promise of what's to come for us. And in Romans, Paul expands on this a little bit. He broadens it, and he speaks about creation itself groaning in expectation and hope of when it will be set free from its bondage to decay and when it will, quote, obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And in the book of James, which the Sunday morning Bible study has been looking at, James writes about those of us who are in Christ becoming a kind of first fruits of God's creatures. I'm not trying to just throw a whole bunch of random Bible verses around this morning, but what I want us to do is begin to get a sense of what God is about, what God has been about from the beginning, that this theme of God being faithful to his creation, it's what's been driving the plot of redemption forward. And I want us to begin to get a real sense of what is so important and profound about Jesus being raised up in the body and then at the end of this passage ascending into heaven. The fact that the word became flesh, that should tell us something about God's commitment to his creation. And the fact that it is this very same Jesus, the resurrected word made flesh, that ascends into heaven, that should tell us something about his continuing commitment to his creation. Did you pick up on that at the end of the passage? That when Jesus ascends, it's not just a spirit or a soul that ascends into heaven. No, it is, it is Jesus. It is the full embodied, resurrected Jesus that ascends into heaven. 
God's commitment and his uniting himself to us as he did in the incarnation. It did not end when Jesus' ministry on earth was over. It continues to this day because the Jesus who ascended to heaven forever remains the resurrected, nail-scarred, word-made flesh. That is who ascended to heaven. That is who sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. And that is who is Lord of all creation. The very one who joined himself to it, that through him all might be made new. The bodily resurrected Christ and his ascension to heaven, I mean, it means that the stuff of life, all of it, it is intimately bound up in the things of heaven. It means that in Christ, creation is caught up in the reign of God. Through Christ, creation is caught up in the reign of God. Because isn't that just what heaven is? That place, that sphere where God's reign is full and uncompromised. So why does this matter? What difference does this make to you and I here this morning? To you and I who will leave this place and go back to our day-to-day -day lives, go back to work tomorrow, or getting up early to make sure that the kids have lunch made when they go off to school, or hanging out with friends, or cutting the grass, or whatever it is we're gonna do this week. Why does this matter? Well, family, let me suggest that it doesn't just matter, but it makes all the difference in the world. Because of salvation and redemption, if that only means a spiritual escape from this world, then quite honestly, most of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, most of what occupies our days and our weeks and our years is in the end unimportant. Because all that would really matter, all that would have a true lasting effect are those things that promote that spiritual escape. But if it is true that Jesus didn't just come to redeem and save your soul, but he came, in fact, to redeem and save you, and not just you, but somehow the destiny of all creation is also now caught up in him and his resurrected life. If that is true, then all of life suddenly becomes sacred and profoundly important and meaningful. And let me tell you why that is good news. It is good news because God has not abandoned his creation, marred by sin, it may be. But he has instead continued to keep his promises to it and to those of us who live and move and breathe and work and play within it. And in Jesus, the ascended, resurrected, word made flesh, in him who is the first fruits of our redemption and the redemption of creation, we see that God's plan really and truly involves making all things new. Do you remember how the book of Revelation ends? It ends with heaven coming down. Heaven coming down, not to replace what is here, but to restore it, to renew all that God has created. And here is the life-changing, the astounding, life-changing part of this. In Jesus, the first fruits of this have already happened. And so you and I and all who are in Christ, we are called into it right now, here, Today, this morning, and tomorrow morning, and Tuesday morning, and Wednesday morning, and on and on. So what you do matters. All of it. What you do in your nine to five job, whatever it happens to be, it matters. Because it is a part of God's creation that is going to be renewed and redeemed. What you do to make your neighborhood a better place, it matters. Engaging issues of justice in the world matters. The day-to-day -day earthly, physical, 
real life of your family, struggles and all, it matters because it is part of the creation that God has made and called good and has promised to renew and restore. The stuff of this world matters in Jesus Christ. The walls between sacred and secular, they're torn down. And I don't mean that we have to do this by making sure that we work the name of Jesus into every conversation or make a Christian version of whatever it is we would normally be doing. It's much deeper than that. And don't get me wrong, please, share Jesus. Share the good news when you have the opportunity. But know that it is, that is not how we make our day-to-day -day lives sacred and meaningful. We don't make them sacred and meaningful. The resurrected Jesus who ascended and now sits at the right hand of the Father, he has already done that. In him, the world that he created has already begun to be renewed with that deep, sacred meaning for no other reason than he has caught creation up into his resurrected life. The good news, the promise of God here as we see in this passage, the person of Jesus ascending to heaven, body and all, is that life matters, creation matters, your life matters, all of it. All of it matters, the struggles, the joys, and the sorrows. Because in Christ, it begins to be a part of the outworking of these first fruits of the redemption that will one day make, be made full and complete. And this doesn't happen naturally. It takes the miracle of the resurrection to happen. It takes that future promise that one day all who are in Christ will be raised to that full and resurrected life just as Christ was raised. But the promise of Jesus' ascension is that this also begins now, even as we look forward to that final day when Christ will come back and we too will be made new and fully restored, fully restored people created in the image of God. Because in Him, the things of this world, they have already begun to be caught up in His resurrected life. And He will come back, not to take us away, but to bring heaven with him. He will come back not to replace or discard what he has called good, but heaven comes down to fully renew and fully restore what God called good at the very beginning. Family, that is the promise that Luke leaves us with at the end of his account of Jesus, with Jesus ascending into heaven does so, and because he does so, all of your life matters and is sacred and is part of the first fruits of God's redemptive purposes in the world. Let's pray. Lord, give us a renewed sense of this this morning, that you have come you have come to reclaim what was yours, what you called good in the beginning. Lord, help us to see and to know that, that extends to all that we do, that all that you have created, it matters. And it is bound up and it is caught up in your resurrected life. Lord, give us a renewed sense of that this morning, that we may do all things to your glory.